For nearly 30 years, Comics Connection has served as Central Pennsylvania's pop culture mecca, with locations in York and Mechanicsburg. But now, you don't have to live in Pennsylvania to shop there. The brand new Comics Connection online store features a wide variety of back issues, graphic novels, games, and much more. Find out why thousands of customers, including such celebrities as Mike Hawthorne, J.F. Gonzalez, Mary San Giovanni, and Brian Keene have made Comics Connection their number one store to shop at over the years. Check out the new online store at comicsconnection.com. That's C-O-M-I-X connection.com. That is not dead, which can eternal lie, and with strange eons a podcast shall rise. H.P. Lovecraft, Weird Tales, Ramsey Campbell, Cthulhu, Laird Baron, Silent Hill, Brian Lumley, Dagon. There's something sinister out there in the cosmos, and the tendrils run deep throughout the universe. Only one woman dares to traverse the web. Mary San Giovanni, who once again is up to cosmic shenanigans. Hi folks, welcome to Cosmic Shenanigans. This is Mary San Giovanni. And as always, I am up to shenanigans of cosmic proportions and looking very much forward this week to bringing you a story called Lesser Demons by Norman Partridge. Lesser Demons, the story, first appeared in Black Wings, New Tales of Lovecraftian Horror, edited by S.T. Joshi. And it's currently included in a collection from Subterranean Press by the same name, Lesser Demons. One of the things I find absolutely fascinating about this approach to cosmic horror is that, and in, and, and we've discussed this in, in other modern cosmic horror stories that in order to establish it as cosmic horror, certain things have to be present, certain things that we've talked about, uh, in, numerous episodes of this show but i think the the true skill of modern cosmic horror authors uh working today is a lot of them can subvert certain things certain tropes about cosmic horror and still have it be a cosmic horror story you know there's certain things that would be have, would have to be present in a fairly traditional way but other things really don't i mean there's there's certain aspects that uh that can be changed or subverted and still maintain the true cosmic horror elements that make it classifiable as a cosmic horror story. Now, I thought about the best way to approach this because what this story essentially is, is a post-apocalyptic cosmic horror story. And I love that idea. In almost all cosmic horror and in pretty much, so far as I can tell, almost all, if not all of Lovecraft's stories, the idea is averting the crisis. Uh, the, the basic premise is that the horror is that this thing exists in the universe, but that by accident or chance or the fact that, you know, literally that the stars were just not aligned properly in that one moment, we avert absolute and total annihilation. And that there's something kind of scary in that and that it's that we come so close so easily to being completely and utterly destroyed. Um, but I like the idea that in Lesser Demons, we're looking at cosmic horror after the world has already, after the creatures uh, have essentially already gotten a foothold. And not only have gotten a foothold in this world, but have started to infect the human population as well. Now, I think it's important to address the main character, John Dalton. Dalton is the sheriff of this town, okay? And I think that perhaps the most direct aspect of inhuman significance is basically uh, exemplified through John Dalton. Now, he's the kind of man 
who who appears in other hor- horror stories. Um, but there's usually a a change of character. Uh, a lot of the hero's journey in stories, anyway, in speculative fiction, and pretty much any kind of story, uh, a lot of times with a male protagonist is. Uh, to go from being fairly insular and, and I don't mean any negative connotation to this, but perhaps self-centered or self-preoccupied to understanding a role of responsibility, of leadership, uh, of, of taking on the mantle of becoming a hero. But there are an awful lot of characters in fiction that are very stoic and very stubbornly insistent on action over reflection and thought, which is almost the opposite kind of character that you'd see, at least in a Lovecraft story and in a lot of of cosmic horror in general. John Dalton is an obstinate man. His continued, continued refusal to understand what's going on, now that doesn't mean that he doesn't accept it. He has long ago accepted that the world that he is living in is dangerous and confusing and terrifying and lonely. And he's accepted that, but he refuses to really think too hard or reflect or try to understand why what is going on is going on. He is concerned only with surviving. He's accepted the monsters as beasts with a place in the food chain. He's accepted uh, th- these these ghoulish incarnations of humanity as just a, na- a natural part of the, the pecking order. And his only real concern is to stay alive. You know, it, it is basically that he has whittled down human existence into a kill or be c- killed attitude. He has absolutely no desire. Uh, to look too far into how things came to be. And in fact, he seems to be resentful of anyone who does. This gives him a kind of, I guess you could call it anxiety, although he would never see it that way. Um, but it's the kind of, I, I would say, driving force, the anxiety that stoic, old-fashioned man's men who survive by instinct and reflex are uncomfortable with. They don't want to think too hard about uh, the the sort of bigger questions in life because they're men of action and not so much. It's it's not an it's not an impingement on their intelligence. Uh, it's an it's a I think a reflection of their comfort level that to them the the priorities the important things in life are uh doing your job staying alive you know and that's pretty much what john dalton does uh he has no sense of you know human uh companionship or or loyalty and 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 at at first uh, that is fairly consistent with a a kind of loner type like this. I mean, we're talking like the Mad Maxes of the world, you know, uh, the, the lone gunman, you know, uh, of, of the old West, the, the Clint Eastwoods that ride into town, do what they got to do and ride out again. Um, he has no concept of home as a sanctuary. Okay. That does not exist to a man like this, just as it probably wouldn't exist to Clint Eastwoods, you know, uh, unnamed cowboy, uh, or to Mad Max. There is no home. There is no sanctuary. And we see this as evidenced by the ease with which he can burn homes or bases or safe houses to the ground and feel nothing about it. Uh, as I mentioned before, he has no real sense of, I don't want to say it's, it's that he has no sense of loyalty. He has a sense of duty. And I think he does have a sense of, of loyalty to the, I think, all-encompassing idea of survival. But he is, uh, he has an almost feral approach to relationships with other people. They are okay so long as they don't get in the way. And when they get in the way, when they start to cause a problem, when they start to stroke that anxiety 
of thinking too hard uh, or, or trying to get too much deeper into truths and revelations that are uncomfortable, uh, he reacts in a very feral sort of way. This is I, almost the exact opposite of one of the tropes of cosmic horror, that there's somebody who is pushing so hard for answers and truth and looking so hard for that, that esoteric occult knowledge that that is their ultimate destruction. It's almost like he, he took that lesson to heart and is going, you know, 180 degrees in the other direction. You know, he does not want to know. And he finds that life can be expendable, even the lives of friends, if they threaten his survival or force him to look at any kind of deeper philosophical questions about the universe and what might lie beyond it. He doesn't want to know where these monsters come from, as strange as they look, as bestial and, and, and vicious and aggressive as they are. He doesn't want to know. Uh, the, the absolute horror with which the saliva of these monsters infects other people and makes them sort of ghoulish, which we're going to come back and talk about in a minute. Um, he doesn't care why. To them, they have ceased to have any significance whatsoever, uh, certainly as human beings. And pretty much as anything important in his life, once they are dead on the ground. Uh, there is no sense of individuality. There is no sense of specialness. Um, human beings are just cogs in the machine to him. Okay. So in that way, despite him being almost the absolute opposite of the general kind of protagonist we see in a Lovecraftian story, let's say, he absolutely epitomizes one of the crucial aspects of a cosmic horror story in that he re reaffirms over and over in little ways and big ways the insignificance of human individuality and, 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 you know, human significance as, uh, any kind of special or individualistic kind of, uh, species or, or sentience in any way. He does not want to search for answers. And I think that over time, um, and maybe this has always been, but I think one of the things that makes us, that makes humanity what it is, is that search for answers. Um, that a way of life that only functions almost like an autonomous, auto auto Automaton. Wow. That was a tough one. Thank you. Um, if you're functioning like an automaton or like some type of feral creature, some type of animal. Okay. Um, and because you're not showing compassion, you're not showing curiosity. Uh, there is no further development of intellect. There is no empathy or sympathy. It strips life of humanity. And it makes, uh, these are the things, the compassion, intellect, curiosity, empathy. These are the things, maybe the only things that make human contribution to the universe significant. Okay. And uh, so it's basically he is just part of the machine. I mean, he says at one point that it feels weird to even say his name. We don't learn the sheriff's name until maybe I think two thirds of the way through the story, he says it feels weird to even say his name and because a name is one of the most important symbols of individual identity. It is one of the things that even ancient cultures, like say ancient Egyptian cultures and, and other ancient cultures, uh, that your name was proof of your existence and proof of your continued existence long after you die, that you are significant because you have been, because you have been named, because you are an individual with an identity, and that that name is a symbol of the identity. And it feels weird to him to say a name, to use his name. And part of it is because he doesn't have anyone to talk to. So, But, but, but I think a, a, a more important aspect of it is that 
to him, individual identity, even his own, is meaningless. It's useless. Uh, and to be honest, all the other characters in the story, with the exception of two, are never referred to by name. And the few, the only two who are referred to by name, the only two that the sheriff does uh, mention by name, are the two who happen to be looking for answers in the world, who happen to be looking for that that deeper philosophical understanding uh, that not only might help uh, under, you know, to 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 be able to quantify and qualify the situation of the world, but maybe to fix it or to amend it in some way. Uh, the first one that he mentions is his deputy, Roy Barnes. Roy Barnes is in some ways, you know, like the sheriff, he's been uh, hardened by the new world that he's in. We tend to, one of, one of the great fears, one of the great phobias of a plague or an epidemic is that we we not only fear the debilitation and the pain and discomfort of illness, and we not only fear the death that illness could bring, but we, I think in some ways, are more terrified by the fear of abandonment, the fear of dehumanization because we are victims of a particular illness. Uh, and it, we can't very well say that history doesn't support that human beings have reacted that way to people, even as recently as this recent pandemic, that there is, out of fear, occasionally a dehumanization of people who are sick. And that does show up here. Uh, and in particular, in connection with Roy Barnes, so we're going to sort of cover two cosmic horror elements Roy is looking for, he's questing for knowledge. He wants to reverse the situation of the world and he's not above experimenting to do it. Now, the problem with experimentation, this is, this is what leads into some of the, the cosmic horror aspects of this. Okay. In the trunk of a Chrysler, uh, and this particular Chrysler had been in an accident. And he, uh, the sheriff and the deputy were called onto the scene. It's the first time that they encounter monsters from this new world. Okay. The way the world is now. Uh, there are these, uh, and they, they're different species of monsters. Uh, some of them look like these big bear type things. And, uh, some of them look like sort of centipede type things. And they're, they're basically described not as that which cannot be described, but in the way that a man who is looking at something in simple, bestial, feral terms might describe them. He describes them as the closest, the closest animal to them that would make sense, or in certain cases, a combination of animals. Um, but they are clearly interdimensional type creatures. They are uh, not traditional uh, cryptid type things, and they seem to be born uh, from the stomachs or the, the trunks of people, uh, they burst out of, I believe it's primarily dead people that whatever this sort of infection, whatever has infected this world, our world, uh, basically makes dead bodies this sort of fertile birthing ground for these nightmare atrocities to be born. And it is a self perpetuating thing. Infection from either the blood of these, of the dead people, or through the saliva of these monsters turns people over time into these ghouls. I mean, literally into uh, dead body eating, you know, grave digging monsters. Now he calls them blood faces, the, the sheriff. He calls them blood faces because I think that, I mean, first of all, when you have a term for something like that, you are othering that a group, whatever it is. These are no longer victims of the, you know, terrible plague of, of monstrosity that has taken over the planet. Um, they have become a thing, a thing to be, they have become an obstacle, a problem to be dealt with. I believe they're called blood faces because 
Um, partially they, when they eat the dead, they get blood all over their faces. Um, a lot of times I think they cough blood into people's faces. Um, there's a couple of different reasons, different significant ideas happening that, uh, but the blood faces are essentially ghouls and there are particularly vivid and powerful scenes. One of them dealing with a bunch of children who are digging up the dead to eat them. And, uh, and we see Dalton's uh, approach to these blood faces. What they represent from a cosmic horror standpoint is that idea that we, that we've talked about before that this, uh, that cosmic horror can very much be a kind of body horror uh, situation that one of the elements of cosmic horror that is often overlooked because it's often seen as a sort of literary quiet kind of horror is the idea that um, bodies are overtaken and physically and mentally altered, okay, that that humans have so little control in these situations that both body and mind and sometimes even soul are left to the whim, the capricious whim of whatever these forces are, to twist and shape and mangle and distort them in any way that these forces want. These also, these creatures also sort of serve as the cult element, I think, um, that although it is not in a traditional sense that these, these creatures are worshiping these monsters or doing anything to bring them into being, they are the keys. They are the doorways through which these monsters can be born. Uh, one of the things that I do find um, that is a somewhat something of a deviation, although it might not have been in Lovecraft's work if he hadn't have been so racist, uh, is the idea, the implication, particularly with these blood faces, given and and all we ever see to to see this implication when when you're reading the story is how they react, the kinds of sounds that these creatures make, uh, particularly if they're being hurt. Or, or captured or, or, um, disadvantaged or inconvenienced in some way. There is an implication that there might still be human thought and feeling inside these creatures, but that whatever was human has been totally eclipsed by the monstrous nature of this otherworldly infection. The problem though is that the sheriff does not see them as human. And for his own survival, for his own safety, he kind of can't. Um, Roy doesn't see them as human either. He manages to, to capture these and, and, and experiment on one or two of them, uh, in order to make use of certain knowledge that he's found in books. Okay. So let's back up a little bit. Remember I mentioned the Chrysler, which was the inciting incident for the sheriff and the deputy. In, in their first interaction with these creatures, the trunk of this Chrysler from which these monsters and ghouls and whatnots emerged originally, at least as far as, you know, they, uh, the sheriff and the deputy have had contact with them. The trunk of the Chrysler had a number of books in it. The deputy, Roy, takes these books because he believes, as many cosmic horror and Lovecraftian protagonists do, that the answer to how things got started and to how they might end could be found in these books. And these books, you know, the sheriff does admit are, uh, I think the most we get out of them is that they're books, you know, written in strange languages and with strange symbols and, and, and whatnots, um, and unpronounceable words. And that some of the words in these books are also the same unpronounceable words that are carved into the faces and bodies, and again, this is another source of the blood on the blood faces, that are carved into the faces and bodies of both these ghoulish and actual dead people, okay? Um, that a lot of the bodies from which these monsters burst forth are bodies that have these carvings uh, of these unpronounceable words in them. Unpronounceable words is a, is a fairly standard staple, I think, of cosmic horror. Um, and it does add a certain, you know, interdimensional, uh, a magical, a cosmic horror aspect uh, of, of origin to where these things come from. The sheriff absolutely 
does not want anything to do with the books or anything to do with Roy's experimenting. He does not want to see the rituals that Roy attempts to perform in order to stop things uh, to the point where he dispatches Roy. He shoots him and kills him because he told Roy no more of this. And Roy kept trying to find an answer anyway. So in true cosmic horror fashion, Roy is ultimately destroyed by his quest for knowledge. Okay. Um, but we do have, we have the books. We've got the unpronounceable words. We've got our, essentially our, our kind of cult in a way. And as I mentioned, we have monsters. We know that they are emerging from their other world through the bodies of dead humans. Okay. And where that other world is, what it is, none of that is significant to, to the sheriff. He does not want to know and does not care. Uh, it is suggested that there is a quote daddy among them, a force that is controlling them from another place. Uh, it is suggested that these things are emissaries, that these are servants, that these are essentially the lesser demons of this otherworldly place, and that maybe they are only clearing the way for some greater demons to come through. Uh, and again, I like that they're, they're kind of referred to as demons because that would be the kind of word you'd use if you were uh, fairly rigid in your thinking and uh, trying to simplify a very complex situation. The other character who is named is Jamal Quinlan. Okay. Uh, at one point, uh, the first time really that we come to find Sheriff Dalton using his name is to these soldiers who are passing through. Uh, they are trying to regulate things. And, and I want to be careful how I explain this because I'm, we've gone to some trouble now to explain the kind of stoicism in the character of the sheriff. I would venture a guess, and I'm not putting words in Norm Partridge's mouth, but I'd venture a guess that one of the reasons soldiers are a symbolic aspect in this story, because you, you'll notice in a lot of cosmic horror, um, the big cavalry forces are never called in because it never gets to that point. It's always a thing, but like there, but, you know, for the, for the grace of a single word, a single element, and, you know, we could have this worldwide catastrophe. But because this is post-apocalyptic, um, and in most post-apocalyptic, uh, stories, we see, uh, humanity's response and humanity's response is to bring in force to meet force. Soldiers, soldiers are, uh, they are, they are brave and they are efficient, but soldiers are trained to do what they're told. Soldiers are trained that the need of the individual is far eclipsed by the greater good and the need of the group. And so individuality is not uh, encouraged or uh, nurtured in the soldiering mentality. Soldiers are basically given commands and are expected to follow those commands without question and without hesitation. And I think that in this particular case, given that it's a cosmic horror story, the presence of soldiers is meant in some symbolic way to reinforce the idea as we discussed before, that individual identity is not significant. It does not matter. The soldiers he comes in contact with uh, discuss with him this, uh, the fact that the, the only thing that they, they literally say, the only thing that matters is understanding how to kill them. Okay. They don't put much stock in scientists or ministers yabbering away about the problem. Uh, they think that the only important knowledge, the only real information they need to be given is how to kill these things and how to do it quickly and efficiently and move on to the next problem. They are essentially a team of John Dalton's, you know, but Jamal Quinlan, who happens to be one of the soldiers, 
suggests that understanding the nature of the beast in order to fight it, or what comes after it, is, I think, uh, he is sort of symbolically representing, at least in modern horror in general, a fairly important concept that to understand is to have mastery over, that to know the nature of the beast is to be prepared enough to fight it. And this seems to be a concept that is at odds with his other fellow soldiers. They essentially ridicule him for wanting to know and understand what he is up against. Um, because as, as far as they're concerned, the why doesn't matter, just the how. And I think Dalton can relate to that, that it, it doesn't matter why they're here. It doesn't matter what they are. All that matters is how to kill them. Now, one of the saddest aspects of this story, and I think perhaps uh, the, the final uh, confirmation of the cosmic horror of the story, is that in the last few paragraphs, the sheriff insists almost to the readership that things are getting better, that they're returning to normal, that in a year's time, he and others will have moved on to other things um, you know, they'll moved on to, you know, the, the jobs that in, in changing things are essentially staying the same. Now, nothing in the story seems to provide evidence that this is true. There is nothing, uh, that to show really that, uh, these monsters, that, that they're winning any kind of war against these monsters. Um, and what, how it comes across to the reader, I think, is as, Sheriff Dalton normalizing this strange new world. And one could argue that that's evidence of classic cosmic horror insanity to insist that the uh, illogical is somehow now logical. Uh, either that or it is the, it's simply the sad and desperate illusion that a lonely, incredibly practical and very forward and direct thinking kind of man is holding on to that in the end life will go on and all that's happening, all that is proof of a world beyond ours will simply just not matter anymore. Um, if that, which is the bigger picture than us, okay, that which is above and beyond us, if that ceases to matter, then in perhaps true nihilistic form, Nothing matters, but continuing on until one ceases to do so. And that seems very much uh, like Dalton's approach to life, that the only thing that's important is that biological imperative to keep going until you stop, until you die. Uh, as I mentioned throughout, Dalton goes to great lengths to avoid looking at the deeper meaning of this new world. And that includes, although this is sort of implied, that he lies to Washington, D.C. about noticing strangers coming through town back in May with strange things. And this would be pretty much the books in the Chrysler's trunk, uh, dead children handcuffed in the back of a car, an iron trident. Uh, he glosses over those things. He, he confirms to the government officials that he never saw anything, never never saw any indication that this world was taking the turn that it is. And one would think that uh, <coughs> that he essentially embodies the ultimate nihilist, that he welcomes a sort of stripping away of humanity and that he's okay with that what's left being an indifferent natural world, a nature that is totally indifferent, um, including indifferent survivalists who basically survive until the day they don't. Um, to me, that's one of the ultimate cosmic horror viewpoints is that uh, if, if basically all of this, all of this revelation of worlds beyond universes means nothing, then the only significance he finds in being alive is a sense of mundane nothingness. 
And I think that there is something so cosmic horrorly terrifying about a, an existence, a living without meaning. Uh, but that I think is, is that sort of underlying principle of a lot of cosmic horror and a lot of some of the most terrifying cosmic horror that in the end, even that which we reframe as significant to us means absolutely nothing. So that's our show for this week. But before I go, we have a special giveaway this week for fans of Cosmic Horror. Cereal Box, that's S-E-R-I-A-L-B-O-X, is offering one lucky listener a free download of Usman Mullocks in the ruins of Mohenjo-Daro, a, uh, by all accounts, super awesome Cosmic Horror story that I'm really looking forward to covering on the show. Anyone who responds with a tweet to at Cosmic Horror Pod, C-O-S-M-I-C-H-O-R-R-O-R-P-O-D on Twitter, with a suggestion of a Cosmic Horror story to review for the show, will be entered into a drawing. Now, you have until 7 p.m. Eastern Standard Time on May 25th, at which time I will be gathering names and drawing the winner. So remember, that is one free download for Usman Malik's In the Ruins of Mohenjo-Daro. You need to tweet at Cosmic Horror Pod with a suggestion of a Cosmic Horror thing to review. It could be a short story, a novel, a movie, video game, whatever, whatever you think should be covered on the show. And you have until 7 p.m. Eastern Standard Time, May 25th. And then I'll be drawing a, a winner and letting the winner know. Cosmic Shenanigans is brought to you by the Brian Keene Radio Network. For advertising and booking, please visit briankeen.com and click podcast slash radio. Thanks for listening, everybody, and I look forward to bringing you more Cosmic Shenanigans. Bye! For nearly 30 years, Comics Connection has served as Central Pennsylvania's pop culture mecca with locations in York and Mechanicsburg. But now, you don't have to live in Pennsylvania to shop there. The brand new Comics Connection online store features a wide variety of back issues, graphic novels, games, and much more. Find out why thousands of customers, including such celebrities as Mike Hawthorne, J.F. Gonzalez, Mary San Giovanni, and Brian Keene, have made Comics Connection their number one store to shop at over the years. Check out the new online store at comicsconnection.com. That's C O M I X connection.com. Cosmic Shenanigans is a production of the Brian Keene Radio Network. You can listen to this episode and all previous episodes for free on Spotify, Apple Podcasts, Stitcher, YouTube, Google Play Music, and wherever else podcasts are available. Cosmic Shenanigans is written and produced by Mary San Giovanni. Our theme music is by Xander Harris. Our engineer is Matt Wilderson. Check out his books on Amazon.com. If you enjoyed this show, you might enjoy our other podcasts, The Horror Show with Brian Keene, Defender's Dialogue, and Grindcast. To advertise on Cosmic Shenanigans, visit briankeen.com and click Podcasts. <laughs>